Hello, I am Professor Sims, and in this video, I will discuss ecosystems, conservation biology, and biodiversity. This is the last in the series of 10 lessons held as part of my Gen Bio 1 course. If you're a student currently enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and course Moodle site for assignments, quizzes, due dates, and other course information. In this unit, we will learn about ecosystem types, the methods used to study ecosystems, trophic levels, energy transfer, ecological models, biogeo chemical cycles, biodiversity, we'll, t we'll talk about how biodiversity is studied and the principles and challenges of conservation, including habitat loss, exotic species, hunting, and climate change. Living in an ecosystem means competition for resources. It's a constant struggle within and between species for things like organic material, sunlight, and nutrients. The way that communities work is influenced by factors like location, rainfall, topography, and species diversity. Ecosystems can be grouped into three main categories, freshwater, ocean, and terrestrial. As you know, oceans cover a very large portion of the earth with both shallow and deep water ecosystems. Freshwater ecosystems include lakes, rivers, and springs, which also support a variety of life. Terrestrial ecosystems are highly variable as well, as we learned in Lesson 9 when discussing the characteristics of terrestrial biomes. Ecosystems face disruptions from both nature and from human activities. These disruptions often throw entire ecosystems off balance. We measure this balance or equilibrium using terms like resistance, which is how well an ecosystem can handle a disruption, and resilience, which is how fast an ecosystem can bounce back after a disruption. Sometimes when humans mess things up too much, an ecosystem can really suffer and it can even be changed so much that it just can't get back to how it was before. The term food chain is often used metaphorically in social contexts where successful individuals are likened to being at the top of the food chain. However, in ecology, a food chain is a precise linear sequence of organisms representing the flow of nutrients and energy from the primary producers at the bottom of the chain to primary consumers, higher level or secondary consumers, on and on all the way up to the apex consumers at the top of the food chain. Each organism occupies a trophic level, with photosynthetic organisms at the bottom as primary producers, herbivores as primary consumers, carnivores as secondary consumers, and so on. There are some limitations to using food chains because they offer a very simplified linear view of an ecosystem, when in reality, organisms and ecosystems often feed across multiple different trophic levels. And so a more accurate representation of an ecosystem is provided by food webs. A food web depicts the complex interactions among primary producers, consumers, and higher level consumers. But both structural models have strengths Food chains are flexible and they're used a lot for analytical modeling, while food webs better capture the ecosystem dynamics. Two main types of food webs exist. We have the grazing food web with plants at the base, and we have detrital food webs where the base is comprised of decomposers that break down organic matter. Most ecosystems integrate both types of food webs in order to recycle material from dead organisms. Figure 46.6 illustrates the complex ecosystem dynamics between organisms across trophic levels in Lake Ontario. The study of changes in ecosystem structure due to environmental changes or internal forces involves various research methodologies. Holistic ecosystem models like food webs aim to capture the entire ecosystem, but face limitations in time, cost, and sometimes ethical concerns. Controlled conditions in experimental systems such as mesocosms or microcosms offer more feasible alternatives, though they may also alter the ecosystem dynamics. Uh, mesocosms, these are partitions of a natural ecosystem that are set aside and used for experimentation, and microcosms are artificial ecosystems that are created in a lab. Scientists use data from both of these different systems to develop model ecosystems that are conceptual, analytical, 
or simulation models. Conceptual models consist of flowcharts that provide a visual representation of, of energy through an ecosystem and how nutrients flow. So it's really similar to the food chain. Uh, your conceptual models are useful for describing ecosystem structure and dynamics and for demonstrating the relationships between different organisms in a community. Figure 46.8 shows the flow of energy through an ecosystem and how the energy decreases as the trophic levels increase. We'll talk about that some more later. When disturbances occur, these models can show how ecosystems shift away from and eventually return to their equilibrium state. They also show how there can be multiple equilibrium states, and this allows for a more accurate representation of the system's complexity. In this way, conceptual ecosystem models aid in predicting and understanding how ecosystems respond to disruption. An analytical ecosystem model involves simplifying a complex ecosystem using mathematical equations and, again, focusing on linear components such as food chains and simple interactions between species. The main purpose of an analytical ecosystem model is to gain insights into the dynamics of the ecosystem, predict how they respond to change, primarily to identify key factors influencing the behavior within an ecosystem. Analytical models are often useful for gaining a broader understanding or making general predictions, but they struggle to provide highly accurate or detailed insights into ecosystem dynamics. For that, we need simulations. Simulation ecosystem models are a computational approach used by scientists to study and understand the dynamics of ecosystems in a more detailed and realistic manner. They use computer programs to replicate the interactions and behaviors within an ecosystem, and they're better equipped to handle the intricate and nonlinear relationships that are present in a real-world system. Simulations can simulate a wide range of factors, including individual behaviors, environmental conditions, and various interactions between and within and among species. By incorporating a more detailed representation of the ecosystem, simulation models offer insights into outcomes of disruptions and also interventions, and they're considered the most accurate and predictive modeling system that we have available today. Living things get their energy in three ways, uh, photosynthesis, chemosynthesis, and heterotrophism. Photosynthesis and chemosynthesis, these are done by autotrophs. These are um, organisms that make their own energy. Plants and algae are photoautotrophs. They use sunlight to create energy, and they form the foundation of food webs. Photoautotrophs turn sunlight into chemical energy, and they use it to make complex organic molecules. Chemoautotrophs are mainly bacteria, and they live in places without sunlight, so they can't use photosynthesis. Instead, they use inorganic molecules like hydrogen sulfide for energy. Heterotrophs include animals, fungi, and some bacteria, and they depend on autotrophs or other heterotrophs for energy. Heterotrophs are essential in ecosystems, contributing to food webs and nutrient cycles through eating and breaking down organic matter. Humans are heterotrophs because we get our energy from consuming plants and animals. Ecosystem structures can be visualized further using ecological pyramids. Ecological pyramids were pioneered by Charles Elton in the 1920s. They depict parameters like energy, biomass, numbers of organisms across trophic levels. They can be upright or inverted, depending on the ecosystem. And again, at the base of the pyramid are the producers, which capture solar energy through the photosynthesis. And then as you move up the pyramid to higher trophic levels, energy decreases. And this is because energy is lost at each trophic level through metabolic processes and through heat. Biomass pyramids represent the total biomass at each trophic level in an ecosystem. We'll discuss biomass in more detail in just a minute, but for now just know that biomass decreases as you move up the trophic levels, similar to how energy decreases as you go up the pyramid. But there can be exceptions. For example, in a forest ecosystem, the biomass of trees, which are producers, might be greater than the biomass of herbivores, which are the consumers. Number pyramids represent the number of individual organisms 
at each trophic level in the ecosystem. The base of the pyramid typically represents a larger number of organisms, usually primary producers or consumers, and that number decreases again as you move up the pyramid to higher trophic levels. This pattern may vary based on the size and reproductive rates of organisms in different trophic levels though. Here is a clip that gives a quick summary of the different types of ecological pyramids. Ecological pyramids are diagrams used to display quantitative data and show the relationship between organisms in an ecosystem. They are made up of bars stacked on top of one another. They can be used to show number of organisms or biomass of each trophic level in the ecosystem. They visually describe the quantities that we see in food chains and food webs. So how does that work? Well, the bottom of the pyramid represents the primary producers, the first trophic level. On top of that go the primary consumers, the second trophic level, and so on up through the secondary consumers, tertiary consumers, until you reach the highest trophic level in that ecosystem. In the ecosystem, the energy is being transferred up the pyramid, as each organism is consumed by the organism in the next trophic level up. The height of the bar should be the same, but the width of the bars should be proportional to the quantity that's being displayed. So, for an ecological pyramid of numbers, the width of the bar shows the number of organisms at that step in the food chain. The unit for this is number of organisms. In the pyramid of biomass, it shows the biomass of organisms, and a common unit for this is grams per meter squared. So let's look at the following pyramid of numbers, which doesn't take into account the size of organisms. In this ecosystem, we have grass, which is eaten by rabbits, who are then eaten by foxes, who are finally eaten by eagles. As you can see in this example, thousands of blades of grass are eaten by lots of rabbits. That then feeds very few foxes. These foxes will then feed a larger number of eagles. The more organisms there are, the wider the bar is. Pyramids of numbers can end up looking a bit wonky. For example, if one primary producer can feed lots of primary consumers, like an oak tree which feeds lots and lots of little caterpillars. Pyramids of biomass, on the other hand, are almost always larger at the bottom and then get smaller going up. This is because, rather than showing the number of organisms, they show the number of the total mass in that trophic level. Think about it this way. One caterpillar weighs about 3 grams. One oak tree weighs about 30 tonnes, which is 30 million grams. So that's 10 million caterpillars to equal the mass of one oak tree. Because of this, the bar for the oak tree will be much wider than the bar for the caterpillars, even though there are far more caterpillars and maybe only one oak tree in the ecosystem. So, to recap, ecological pyramids are diagrams that we use to visually represent the relationship between organisms in an ecosystem. The bars each represent trophic levels, and their order represents the flow of energy. The width of the bar in the number pyramids represents the number of organisms in that trophic level. The width of the bar in biomass pyramids represents the biomass of the organisms in that trophic level. Biomass refers to the total mass of living organisms, that is plants, animals, and microorganisms like bacteria, present in a given area or ecosystem at a specific point in time. It is a measure of the living biological material in an ecosystem and provides an indication of the amount of energy stored in the form of organic matter. Gross primary productivity is the total amount of organic matter or biomass produced by autotrophs through photosynthesis in a specific area in time before any energy is expended for the plant's own metabolic needs. Gross primary productivity is the total energy captured by autotrophs from sunlight that is converted into organic matter and provides the foundation for the entire food web in an ecosystem. Net primary productivity is the actual energy or biomass that's available for consumption by heterotrophs or consumers after you subtract the energy used by autotrophs for their own metabolic activities like respiration. Net primary productivity reflects the energy available for the growth and reproduction of plants that can be consumed by herbivores, and it's important for understanding the amount of energy transferred to higher trophic levels in the food chain or in a food pyramid. Trophic level transfer efficiency measures how much energy gets passed from plants to herbivores and then again passed to carnivores. So scientists figure out trophic level transfer energy by comparing energy at different levels. They express it as a percentage, showing how much energy is kept and passed on to the next level. 
High efficiency means that a lot of energy moves up the chain, while low efficiency means that more energy gets lost. Net production efficiency is the ratio of the energy stored in the tissues of plants, or primary producers, to the energy that they receive through photosynthesis. Net production efficiency considers how effectively plants use that energy for their growth and maintenance after accounting for their own energy needs. Net consumer productivity refers to the efficiency with which consumers, typically animals, convert the energy they obtain from their food into new biomass after subtracting the energy expended through respiration and metabolic processes. Net consumer productivity is a measure of the net energy that becomes available for the next trophic level in a food chain or a food web. Biomagnification is a process in which the concentration of certain substances like toxins or pollutants increases at higher trophic levels within a food chain or a food web. So initially pollutants or other substances are introduced into the environment through human activities like industrial processes, pesticide use, or the release of chemical pollutants. Then producers, typically plants or algae, absorb these substances from the environment and the concentration is going to be relatively low at this first trophic level. But as herbivores feed on the plants and algae, the concentration of the toxins and pollutants can increase. And this is because each herbivore accumulates a slightly higher concentration than its food source. The process continues as predators or higher trophic level consumers feed on herbivores and then with each step up the food chain, the concentration of substances magnifies, leading to higher levels of accumulation in top predators. Top predators, often the apex of the food chain, can experience significant biomagnification with concentrations of substances reaching levels that can be harmful to their health. And this is because they have the cumulative effects of the substances being consumed throughout the food chain. Common substances involved in this biomagnification process include persistent organic pollutants, heavy metals, and certain pesticides. The phenomenon is a concern in environmental science and conservation because it can lead to adverse effects on wildlife populations and can even pose risks to human health when humans consume contaminated organisms, especially those at higher trophic levels in the food chain. Let's watch this quick overview of trophic levels and bioaccumulation. The picture you see in an ecosystem's magic eye is actually dictated by the organisms that live there and how they use what comes into it. An ecosystem can be measured through figuring out things like its biomass, that is the total weight of living things in the ecosystem, and its productivity, how much stuff is produced and how quickly stuff grows back, how good the ecosystem is at retaining stuff. And of course all these parameters matter to neighboring ecosystems as well, because if one ecosystem is really productive, the ones next door are going to benefit. So first things first. Where do the energy and materials come from? And to be clear, when I talk about materials, I'm talking about water or nutrients like phosphorus or nitrogen or even toxins like mercury or DDT. Let's start out by talking about energy, because nothing lives without energy, and where organisms get their energy tells the story of an ecosystem. You remember physics, right? The laws of conservation state that energy and matter can neither be destroyed or created. They can only get transferred from place to place to place. The same is true of an ecosystem. Organisms in an ecosystem organize themselves into a trophic structure with each organism situating itself in a certain place in the food chain. All of the energy in an ecosystem moves around within this structure, because when I say energy, of course I mean food. For most ecosystems, the primary source of energy is the sun, and the organisms that do most of the conversion of solar energy into chemical energy, you know this one. Who rules the world? The plants rule the world. Autotrophs, like plants, are able to gather up the sun's energy and through photosynthesis make something awesome out of it, little stored packets of chemical energy. So whether it's plants, bacteria, or protists that use photosynthesis, autotrophs are always the linchpin of every ecosystem. The foundation upon which all other organisms in the system get their energy and nutrients. For this reason, ecologists refer to plants as primary producers. Now obviously the way that energy gets transferred from plants to animals is by the animal 
alone eating the plant. For this reason, herbivores are known as primary consumers, the first heterotrophs to get their grubby paws on that sweet, sweet energy. After this stage in the trophic structure, the only way to wrestle the solar energy that was in the plants that the herbivore ate is to, you guessed it, eat the herbivore, which carnivores, known as secondary consumers, are very happy to do. And assuming that the ecosystem is big enough and productive enough, there might even be a higher level of carnivore that eats other carnivores, like an owl that eats hawks, and these guys are called tertiary consumers. And then there are the vores that decompose all of the dead animal and plant matter, as well as the animal poop, detritivores. These include earthworms and sea stars and fiddler crabs and dung beetles and fungi and anything else that eats the stuff that none of the rest of us would touch with a three meter pole. So that's a nice hierarchical look at who's getting energy from what or whom within an ecosystem. But of course, organisms within an ecosystem don't usually abide by these rules very closely, which is why these days we usually talk about food webs rather than food chains. A food web takes into consideration that sometimes a fungus is going to be eating nutrients from a dead squirrel, and other times squirrels are going to be eating the fungi. Sometimes a bear likes to munch on primary producers, blueberry bushes, and other times it's going to be snacking on secondary consumer, like a salmon. And even at the tippy tippy top, predators get eaten by stuff like bacteria in the end, which might or might not be the same bacteria that ate the top predator's poopies. Circle of life! It's also worth noting that the size and scope of the food web in an ecosystem has a lot to do with things like water and temperature, because water and temperature are what plants like, right? And without plants, there isn't going to be a whole lot of trophic action going on. Take, for example, the Sonoran Desert, which we've talked about before. There aren't very really many plants there compared to, say, the Amazon rainforest, so the primary producers are limited by the lack of water, which means that primary consumers are limited by lack of primary producers. And that leaves precious few secondary consumers, a few snakes, some coyotes, and hawks. All this adds up to the Sonoran not being a terribly productive place, compared to the Amazon, at least, so you might only get to the level of tertiary consumer occasionally. Now, all this conversation about productivity leads me to another point, about ecosystem efficiency. When I talk about energy getting passed along from one place to another within an ecosystem, I mean that in a general sense. Organisms are sustaining each other, but not in a particularly efficient way. In fact, when energy transfers from one place to another, from a plant to a bunny, or from a bunny to a snake, the vast majority of that energy is lost along the way. So let's take a cricket. That cricket has about one calorie of energy in it. And in order to get that one calorie of energy in it, it had to eat about 10 calories of lettuce. Where did the other nine calories go? It is not turned into cricket flesh. Most of it is used just to live, like to power its muscles, or run the sodium potassium pumps in its neurons. It's just used up. So only the one calorie of the original ten calories of food is left over as actual cricket stuff. And then, right after his last meal, the cricket jumps into a spider web and is eaten by a spider, who converts only ten percent of the cricket's energy into actual spider stuff. And don't get me started on the bird that eats the spider. This is not an efficient world that we live in. But you want to know what's scary efficient? The accumulation of toxins in an ecosystem. Elements like mercury, which are puffed out of the smokestacks of coal-fired power plants, end up getting absorbed in the ocean by green algae and marine plants. While the tiny animal that eats the algae only stores 10% of the energy it got, it keeps 100% of the mercury. So as we move up the chain, each trophic level consumes 10 times more mercury than the last. And that's what we call bioaccumulation. Concentrations get much higher at each trophic level until a human gets a hold of a giant tumor that's at the top of the marine food chain, and none of that mercury has been lost. It's all right there in that delicious tuna flesh. Because organisms only hold on to 10% of the energy they ingest, each trophic level has to eat about 10 times its biomass to sustain itself. And because 100% of that mercury moves up the food chain, that means that it becomes 10 times more concentrated with each trophic level it enters. That's why we need to take the seafood advisory seriously. As somebody who could eat anything you wanted, it's probably safest to eat lower on the food chain. Primary producers or primary consumers, the older, bigger, higher in the food chain, the more toxic it's going to be. Water is essential for all life on Earth, and the water cycle, also known as the hydro logical cycle is a continuous and natural process through which water circulates between the earth's surface the atmosphere and then back down again it involves various stages each contributing to the movement and distribution of water on the planet uh, it begins with the process of evaporation where water from oceans rivers and lakes and even the surface of plants and soil it turns into water vapor due to heat from the sun as the water vapor rises into the atmosphere, it cools and condenses into tiny water droplets or ice crystals forming clouds. This process is known as condensation. 
When the water droplets and clouds combine and become too heavy, they fall back to the Earth's surface as precipitation. Precipitation can take various forms, including rain, snow, sleet, or hail. Once precipitation reaches the Earth's surface, it either infiltrates into the soil, becoming groundwater, or it runs off the surface, eventually flowing into rivers, lakes, or oceans. Some of the water is also taken up by plants in a process called transpiration. In addition to evaporation, there's a process called sublimation, where ice and snow can turn directly into water vapor without melting first. This contributes to the water vapor content in the atmosphere. Um, transpiration refers to the movement of water through the atmosphere, including the transfer of water va vapor by wind from one region to another. Water accumulates in various reservoirs like oceans, lakes, rivers, glaciers, and underground aquifers until it is once again subjected to evaporation and then the cycle continues. Living organisms are interconnected through carbon exchange, primarily as atmospheric carbon dioxide. The carbon cycle is the movement and exchange of carbon between the Earth's atmosphere, oceans, soil, rocks, and living organisms. Plants, algae, and some bacteria perform photosynthesis, a process that includes absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and converting it into organic compounds like glucose. Plants, animals, and microorganisms release carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere through respiration. And during respiration, they break down organic compounds to produce energy, and this releases carbon dioxide as a byproduct. Decomposers such as fungi and bacteria break down dead plant and animal matter. This process releases carbon back into the soil in the form of organic matter or into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. The burning of fossil fuels such as coal, oil, and natural gas releases stored carbon back into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Oceans act as a significant carbon sink by absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and this absorption occurs through physical and biological processes and helps to regulate atmospheric carbon levels. Phytoplankton and marine plants perform photosynthesis in the ocean, similar to terrestrial plants, taking in carbon dioxide and converting it into organic matter. Like terrestrial ecosystems, the ocean also experiences respiration and decomposition processes, releasing carbon back into the water and atmosphere. Some carbon is used by marine organisms to form carbonate shells, which may eventually sink to the ocean floor. Over geological time, these deposits can become sedimentary rocks, and they sequester carbon for extended time periods. The carbon cycle is dynamic and interconnected, with carbon continuously cycling through these various reservoirs. Human activities, particularly the burning of fossil fuels, deforestation, and land use changes have significantly impacted the carbon cycle, leading to an increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations and contributing to global climate change. More on that later. Getting nitrogen into the living world poses a challenge because even though nitrogen gas makes up about 78% of the Earth's atmosphere, atmospheric nitrogen is relatively inert and it needs to be converted into usable forms through biological and physical processes. The nitrogen cycle is the movement and transformation of nitrogen through different forms in the environment. First, you have nitrogen fixing bacteria. These can be either free living or symbiotic and they convert atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia. Some plants, like legumes, form symbiotic relationships with these bacteria and can directly assimilate the fixed nitrogen. Ammonia is first converted into nitrite by ammonia oxidizing bacteria. Another group of bacteria then transforms the nitrite into nitrate. Nitrate is a form of nitrogen that plants can readily absorb and utilize. Plants take up nitrate and ammonia from the soil and assimilate these nitrogen compounds into amino acids, proteins, and other organic molecules. Animals obtain nitrogen by consuming plants or other animals, and then decomposers, such as bacteria and fungi, break down organic matter from dead plants and animals, releasing ammonia into the soil, and denitrification. Denitrification helps regulate nitrogen levels in the soil and prevents an excess of nitrogen in ecosystems. Phosphorus is a vital nutrient used in the production of nucleic acids, like DNA, RNA, phospholipids, and even bones. 
The phosphorus cycle is the process by which phosphorus moves through different components of the Earth's environment. Unlike carbon and nitrogen, phosphorus does not have an atmospheric component. Phosphorus is present mostly in rocks, minerals, and sediments. And over time, weathering processes like erosion and rain break down the rocks and release phosphorus into the soil. Plants absorb inorganic phosphate from the soil, which becomes incorporated into their tissues. Animals obtain phosphorus by consuming plants or other animals. And when plants and animals die, decomposers such as bacteria and fungi break down their organic matter. And during composition, phosphorus is released back into the soil. Phosphorus in the form of phosphate can accumulate in sediments at the bottom of bodies of water. Over geological time, these sediments may become rocks, completing the cycle by locking up phosphorus for extended periods. Phosphorus can be leached from soil into water bodies during precipitation or irrigation events. This dissolved phosphorus contributes to the nutrient content in aquatic ecosystems. Surface runoff from agricultural fields or other areas with phosphorus-containing fertilizers can transport phosphorus into rivers and lakes. Excess phosphorus in water bodies can lead to eutrophication, which causes algal blooms and other ecological problems. Sulfur is used by living organisms in the formation of disulfide bonds in proteins. Sulfur cycles between oceans, land, and the atmosphere. Atmospheric sulfur, mainly sulfur dioxide, enters from organic decomposition, volcanic activity, and human burning of fossil fuels. On land, sulfur is deposited through precipitation, fallout, rock weathering, and geothermal vents. Terrestrial ecosystems use soil sulfates and release sulfur back into the atmosphere as hydrogen sulfide upon decomposition. Human activities, particularly burning fossil fuels like coal, disrupt the sulfur cycle. For example, increased hydrogen sulfide emissions lead to the formation of acid rain, which causes environmental harm by lowering the pH of water in lakes and rivers. Here is a video that summarizes the cycling of biogeochemicals on Earth. Unlike energy that is lost as heat, the six most common elements in organic molecules carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur are conserved in biogeochemical cycles. Welcome to Moo Moo Math and Science. Geological processes such as weathering of rocks, the erosion, and the subduction of continental plates all play a role in this recycling of matter along with interactions among organisms and chemical processes. The way in which an element, or in some cases a compound such as water, moves between living factors, also called biotic factors, and non-living factors, also called abiotic factors, is called a biogeochemical cycle. Now that's a mouthful. This name reflects the importance of chemistry and geology as well as biology in helping us understand these cycles. So which biogeochemical cycles are key to life on Earth? Up first, water. All oxygen-dependent organisms need water to aid in the respiration process. Water also helps many organisms regulate metabolism and dissolves compounds going into and out of the body. In other words, no water equals no life. Next, you can remember the elements that have biogeochemical cycles using SHANOPs. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur. Put them together and you have SHANOPs. Carbon is found in all organic micromolecules. It's a building block of life. Carbon is so important to life because virtually all molecules in the body contain carbon. Hydrogen. It's an element which is present in all the fluids of the human body, which allows the toxins and waste to be transported and eliminated. It is also a building block of water, which, you know, is essential for life. Nitrogen. This is needed to build our amino acids and proteins. Oxygen. It's vital for cellular respiration. During cellular respiration, glucose reacts with oxygen, forming ATP that can be used by the cell. Phosphorus is a key component of DNA and RNA. Sulfur is key to protein structure and is released to the atmosphere by the burning of fossil fuels. 
Though each element or compound takes its own route, all of these key chemical nutrients cycle through the biosphere, moving between the biotic or living and abiotic non-living worlds from one living organism to another. Biodiversity, short for biological diversity, refers to the variety of life on Earth at all levels of biological organization, including diversity of species, ecosystem, and genetic diversity within species. It encompasses the richness and variety of living organisms, their interactions, and the ecological processes that support life. Biodiverse ecosystems tend to be more resilient and stable, with the ability to recover from disturbances and adapt to changes. Many industries depend on biodiversity, including agriculture, medicine, and tourism. Biodiversity provides resources such as food, pharmaceuticals, and materials for construction. Biodiversity contributes to cultural identity and provides recreational opportunities. Many people derive enjoyment, inspiration, and even spiritual value from nature. Forests, wetlands, and other ecosystems play a crucial role in regulating the climate by sequestering carbon dioxide and influencing weather patterns. Biodiversity, specifically the diversity of pollinators, and natural predators supports agricultural productivity by facilitating pollination and controlling pests. Despite its importance, biodiversity faces many threats, primarily due to human activities such as habitat destruction, pollution, climate change, overexploitation of species, and the introduction of invasive species. For example, in the 1980s, there were hundreds of species of cichlids in Lake Victoria, and each of them had diverse specializations and lived in different niches within the lake. The introduction of the Nile perch in 1963 led to the decline of cichlids, impacting around 200 species. Factors like declining water quality, increased fishing, and the Nile perch's predatory impact contributed to their eventual extinction. Biodiversity encompasses genetic diversity, species diversity, and ecosystem diversity. Genetic diversity focuses on the variety of genes within a species and includes the diversity of genetic material within populations of the same species, allowing for adaptations to changing environments, and it provides the basis for evolution. Species diversity is the variety of different species in a particular area, and it includes the number of species present, known as species richness, and their abundance relative to one another, known as species evenness. Ecosystem diversity considers the variety of ecosystems, habitats, and ecological processes in a larger region. It includes different types of forests, grasslands, wetlands, deserts, and other ecosystems, each with their unique sets of species and environmental conditions. Despite ongoing efforts, our understanding of Earth's species is inadequate. Approximately 1.5 million named eukaryote species represent less than 20% of the estimated 8.7 million eukaryotes on Earth. Prokaryotic species estimates remain speculative, lacking a centralized repository for names and samples. The accelerating loss of species akin to the Lake Victoria cichlid scenario underscores our limited grasp of diminishing biodiversity. Recent estimates that are shown in Table 47.1 outline biodiversity across different groups, but efficient species cataloging remains challenging. Despite initiatives and internet advancements, the, the current rate of new species descriptions, which is about 17,000 to 20,000 per year, suggests that it may take nearly 500 years to complete this task. Beyond mere accounting, naming and counting species involve, it involves a complex process of identifying unique characteristics, determining relationships, and recognizing the potential value for humans and dependent species. Biodiversity varies across the globe. For instance, latitude and age are key factors influencing biodiversity patterns. Generally, species diversity increases closer to the equator, with the tropics exhibiting 
higher biodiversity than the poles, for example. Multiple hypotheses such as the greater age of the tropical ecosystems and increased solar energy attempt to explain this phenomenon. While biodiversity is highest in the tropics, the richness also represents challenges as knowledge of species remains low and there's a significant risk of biodiversity loss. In other words, we run the risk of losing these species before we can even identify them. The map in figure 47.3 shows the number of amphibian species across the globe and shows the trend towards higher biodiversity at lower latitudes. A similar pattern is observed for most endemic species on Earth. In 1988, British environmentalist Norman Myers introduced the concept of biodiversity hotspots, aiming to pinpoint areas rich in species and facing a high risk of species loss. These hotspots are regions with a high concentration of endemic species, and the idea was to prioritize conservation efforts on these hotspots. Uh, originally, a hotspot needed 1,500 or more endemic plant species and 70% of the area affected by human activity. Currently, there's 34 biodiversity hotspots that include half of Earth's endemic plants. Figure 47.4 shows on a map where these 34 diversity hotspots are. And what's really interesting is that it only covers about 2.3% of the Earth's surface. But yeah, this is about 42% of terrestrial vertebrates and about half of the world's plants. Biodiversity on Earth has fluctuated greatly throughout geologic time. There is a natural ebb and flow in the big picture of evolution and speciation. Um, when speciation rates surpass extinction rates, we see an increase in the number of species and vice versa. This phenomenon is illustrated in figure 47.5, which shows a number of extinction events that have occurred in Earth's history as reflected in the fossil record. We will discuss these mass extinction events in more detail, but first let's have a look at the history of life on Earth. And by 1.5 billion years ago, we start seeing multicellular eukaryotic organisms in the fossil record, the very first of them probably being algae. But it wasn't until around 535 million years ago that the eukaryotes went berserk. And that's known as the Cambrian Explosion, a super major biological golden age when the diversity of all animal life on Earth exploded. Nobody's entirely sure what started it, but suddenly life created innovations that the planet had never seen. Creatures used minerals and seawater to build skeletons and shells. Some acquired weapons like claws, while others developed defensive plates. The evolutionary arms race between predators and prey was underway. This heralded the dawn of the Phanerozoic Eon, the one that we're in right now. That's right, the Earth spent the better part of two eons under the rule of a bunch of archaea and bacteria and some, like, soft-bodied worms. Until the Cambrian exploded and we started to see a lot of animal phyla that we actually are hanging out with today. After the Cambrian, the party got so hot in the oceans that by the Ordovician period, around 500 million years ago, plants, animals, and fungi started colonizing land, probably as a strategy for escaping predation. Now there were whole new ecosystems to explore and adapt to and create. During the Devonian period, about 365 million years ago, tetrapods, four-legged vertebrates that probably evolved from lobe-finned fishes showed up on land, and so did arthropods like insects and spiders. From here, we begin to see ecological systems that we recognize today, because organisms were changing their environments by consuming oxygen in the atmosphere and releasing carbon dioxide. And you know who likes carbon dioxide? The plants. The Carboniferous period that extended from 359 to 299 million years ago was when the plants entirely went nuts. The forests were so dense and so widespread that they made all our fossil fuels. All the coal and oil that we now use to power all the things with were made over the course of about 60 million years. This time it was the plants that had changed both the climate and the geology of Earth. These forests cranked out so much oxygen that the atmosphere contained around 35% oxygen rather than today's like 21%. All this oxygen started cooling the planet because there wasn't enough carbon dioxide to maintain the balmy temperatures that the vast Carboniferous jungles needed to survive. So the whole system crashed and all the carbon from these forests sunk into swamps and eventually got locked in rocks. Of course, now we're releasing all of that carbon by burning fossil fuels, which is certainly helping to keep the planet toasty now. That right there, some good ecology. In the Permian period, 299 to 251 million years ago, all the land masses of the world joined to form one giant continent that we call Pangaea, altering global climate and ocean currents and animals and plants evolved in response. We start seeing gymnosperms, the first plants with seeds like modern pines and spruces and firs, and archosaurs, the granddaddies of dinosaurs and modern birds showed up. But you probably picked up enough of the pattern here to predict that this party didn't last forever. About 252 million years ago, 
something happened, or maybe a lot of things happened in quick succession. But whatever they were, movie executives take note, the Permian-Triassic extinction event would make the most awesome disaster film of all time. Because up to 96% of all marine species and 70% of terrestrial vertebrate species bought the farm. And it's the only known mass extinction of insects. About 57% of all taxonomic families and 83% of all genera became extinct. It was the most significant extinction event on the planet ever. It's been hard to pinpoint the reason for this extinction event because most of the evidence has been wiped out, of course. It may have been kicked off by an asteroid that released the energy equivalent to the detonation of a few million nuclear weapons all at once. And then insult added to injury when a whole bunch of volcanoes erupted, methane was released from the seafloor, there were probably some gas explosions in what's now Siberia, and then a whole bunch of climate changes, sea level change, and changes in ocean salinity probably occurred. Nobody's sure exactly what happened, but we do know that it took a long time for life on Earth to make a comeback. But look at the bright side. As a result of the Permian-Triassic event, we got dinosaurs. They were able to evolve during the Triassic because there wasn't much competition for resources, so they evolved to fill an available niche. That is a combination of living and non-living resources that they could use to survive. Remember that word, because a lot of ecology comes down to who's exploiting or leaving or getting kicked out of or altering their niches. And during the Triassic period, there were tons of niches. The sky was the limit because, hey, there weren't very many animals or plants to compete with. So by the Jurassic period, about 199 million years ago to 145 million years ago, huge herbivorous dinosaurs were roaming the Earth. Smaller, mean as crap, carnivorous dinos were stalking the herbivores. The oceans were full of giant squid and ichthyosaurs and long-necked plesiosaurs. The air was full of pterosaurs and the first birds. And there were mammals, small ones, but they were all over the place. It just wasn't our time to shine. The Jurassic was dino time, and the dinos lived it up. They partied down until about 65 million years ago when they all went extinct, as I'm sure you're aware, except for their surviving descendants, the birds. It was probably an asteroid that hit the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico that did them in, but other theories suggest it could have been climate change due to increased volcanic activity and the possibility that they just couldn't adapt to changes in other living things around them. For instance, about 100 million years ago, angiosperms, or flowering plants, first appeared, and they did really well, especially since flying insects evolved with them, providing a great vehicle for reproduction. This is a great example of another ecological principle, co-evolution. But dinosaurs like to eat the old-fashioned gymnosperms. We know that from studying their fossilized poop. So maybe their pickiness made them go extinct. Who knows? And with the dinos out of the picture, mammals and birds were free to take over. And this is where the flora and fauna on planet Earth start looking a lot more like they do today. Since then, there have been climate fluctuations and extinction events and the evolution of many animals and plants, including humans. So throughout Earth's history, there have been five major mass extinction events during which a significant portion of the planet's biodiversity was wiped out. These events saw rapid and widespread extinctions of various species and were caused by very, a variety of factors, and they have shaped the course of evolution and life on Earth. The Ordovician Silurian extinction occurred about 443 million years ago. The primary cause is unclear, but it's thought to be related to a series of glaciations and sea level changes. Possible trigger could be a drop in sea level, reducing habitats for marine organisms. Around 85% of marine species, particularly those in shallow seas, became extinct during this time. The late Devonian extinction happened about 359 to 375 million years ago. It was caused by multiple factors, including climate change, sea level fluctuation, and a possible asteroid impact. Approximately 75% of species were lost, with significant losses among marine and terrestrial life, particularly fish. The Permian-Triassic extinction was about 252 million years ago, often referred to as the Great Dying. It is believed to have resulted from a combination of volcanic activity leading to massive eruptions and potential asteroid impacts. This was the most severe mass extinction with an estimated 96% of marine species and 70% of terrestrial species becoming extinct, and it profoundly affected life on both land and in the ocean. The Triassic-Jurassic extinction was a little over 200 million years ago. Uh, potential causes include volcanic activity, climate change, and asteroid impacts. About 80% of marine species were lost, including many coral reef organisms. On land, some reptile groups suffered losses, allowing for the rise of the dinosaurs. The Cretaceous-Paleogene extinction occurred about 66 million years ago. A widely accepted cause is the impact of a large asteroid near the Yucatan Peninsula that led to the formation of the Chicxulub crater. This impact triggered wildfires and a nuclear winter, causing dramatic climate change, and it led to the extinction of approximately 75% of Earth's species, including the dinosaurs. It paved the way for the rise of mammals and birds as the dominant species on Earth.
the term Holocene mass extinction. This is the sixth extinction, and it refers to the ongoing period of significant biodiversity loss that's happening during the Holocene epoch that started about 11,700 years ago and continues to the present day. While not as dramatic as some of the major mass extinctions in Earth's history, the Holocene extinction event is notable for the accelerated rate at which species are disappearing, largely due to human activities. Key factors contributing to the Holocene mass extinction include habitat destruction, overexploitation, pollution, climate change, introduction of invasive species, and the spread of diseases. Notable examples of species affected by the Holocene mass extinction include various mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, and insects. Some high-profile extinctions or near extinctions include the dodo bird, stellar sea cow, passenger pigeon, the Carolina parakeet, Japanese sea lion, and several others including the West African black rhinoceros and the Pinta island tortoise. The Red List of Threatened Species is a comprehensive inventory that assesses the global conservation status of animal, plant, and fungi species. It is maintained by the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the IUCN. This is a global organization dedicated to the conservation of nature and sustainable use of natural resources. The red list includes 380 species of vertebrates that have gone extinct since the 1500s, and 86 of these extinctions are attributed to overhunting or overfishing. Estimating extinction rates is a complex process that involves a combination of field observations, ecological modeling, and statistical analyses. It's important to note that there are quite a lot of species that may never be observed, which means that they can become extinct without us ever knowing about them. The background extinction rate refers to the average rate at which species go extinct over long geological time periods in the absence of significant sudden environmental changes. It represents the natural or baseline level of extinction that occurs and is usually expressed as a percentage or number of species going extinct over a million years. The species area relationship is an ecological principle that describes the relationship between the size of a geographic area and the number of species it can support. It's often observed that larger areas tend to have more diverse ecosystems and a greater number of species than smaller areas. This relationship is a fundamental concept in ecology and conservation biology and is commonly represented graphically as shown in figure 47.7. As we previously discussed, biodiversity faces many threats, including habitat loss, overhunting, overfishing, introduction of exotic and invasive species, disease, and climate change. Biodiversity is under threat. Human activity has degraded our natural resources. Our cities are overpopulated and polluted. We are polluting our oceans. We are clearing forests for agriculture and development. Our actions have altered ecosystems, accelerating species decline, habitat loss, and climate change. Science tells us that biodiversity, the foundation of our economies, livelihoods, food security, and health, is rapidly declining. A recent UN report, based on studies by experts from more than 50 countries, provides a comprehensive picture of the relationship between unsustainable economic development pathways and their impacts on nature. The UN has warned that up to one million plant and animal species are on the verge of extinction. More species are now threatened with extinction than at any other point in human history. And are likely to go extinct within decades unless their habitats are restored. Glaciers are melting. Sea levels are rising. Communities around the world are experiencing more frequent floods, hurricanes, and typhoons, causing detrimental loss and damage to human life and the economy. Wildlife poaching and habitat loss are threatening species into extinction. By burning fossil fuels, we're polluting our air and raising the Earth's temperature. The world is on course for a 3.7 to 4.8 degrees Celsius temperature increase by year 2100, which would cause catastrophic and irreparable damage, wiping away coastlines and turning our forests into savannas. 
Figure 47.10 shows the cyclical fluctuations of atmospheric carbon dioxide over the past 400,000 years. The burning of fossil fuels in recent history has caused a dramatic increase in the levels of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere, which have now reached levels that we've never seen in human history. One effect of increased CO2 and global temperatures is shown in, 40, in figure 47.15. Since 2008, grizzly bears have been spotted further north than their historical range, and as a result, grizzly bear habitat now overlaps with polar bear habitat, and it turns out the two bear species are capable of mating and producing viable offspring. So now we have grizzly bear and polar bear hybrids, known as growler bears. Around the world, Laws and treaties work to safeguard species diversity. The Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, also known as CITES, was established in 1975 and it aims to prevent over 33,000 listed species from being transported across borders, curbing their capture or killing during international trade. However, its effectiveness depends on countries' ability and willingness to enforce it. Some countries have enacted laws protecting endangered species like the 1973 U.S. Endangered Species Act. While valuable, these laws face challenges in listing species, implementing management plans, and potentially removing species without true improvement. Focusing on individual species rather than entire ecosystems is often inefficient, and the ESA's critical habitat provision, although beneficial, can have limitations as well. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act, the MBTA, since 1918, it has protected over 800 species, making it illegal to harm or distribute their parts. Private nonprofits such as IUCN, Traffic, and innovative organizations like the Nature Conservancy contribute significantly to global conservation efforts. The Paris Climate Agreement, while primarily addressing carbon emissions, holds potential to impact biodiversity by mitigating climate change effects. However, its effectiveness has yet to be assessed. Wildlife and ecosystem preserves are vital conservation tools, but they are challenged by difficulties in determining the amount and quality of protected areas, and there's ongoing debates regarding legislation. Preserve limitations include political and economic pressures, enforcement issues, and ongoing impacts of climate change. Captive breeding programs and zoos help to contribute to conservation by educating the public and through their captive breeding programs, especially for endangered species. Overall, conservation efforts require a multifaceted approach, considering not only protected areas and captive breeding, but also addressing broader issues like habitat restoration, human activities, and global agreements. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the description for more videos related to these topics and leave your questions for me in the comments below.